We've been involved in dubstep since day one. We're both from Croydon and we used to go to Big Apple Records. We've known Benga and Scream since they were 16 years old. We just come here tonight because we're proud of them. I like a bit of Scream and Benga, a bit of Burial. We like the bass and the yeah. beat and the vocals as well. It used, to, it used to be like quite an underground thing and now they've just brought it because of Benga and all that and Katie B, they brought it to like Forfeit. <laughs> It was amazing, it was amazing. Every sort of set has gone off. Every uh, night has been the nuts. Yeah. Manchester, I have to send a massive shout out to all, all the Manchester, everyone who was aware of us project because it was like a defining moment. Yeah, but Scotland as well, Scotland was absolutely so mental. But in Brighton last night. Yeah, yeah they, they smashed it. They smashed it, everyone has. They were hanging upside down off of bars in the ceiling and nearly killing themselves. But yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, amazing, amazing tour. The mighty Magnetic Man, fresh off stage on the London leg of their UK tour. Dubstep is massive in 2010, and Magnetic Man, made up of Benga, Scream and artwork, is all up in our bass-seeking grills. But just how did these three blokes from Croydon get to be one of 2010's biggest acts? And how did this dub-influenced offshoot of the UK two-step garage scene, played solely in a tiny underground club in London, grow to be one of the hottest musical genres in the world right now? We're about to find out. You're listening to Radio 1 and 1 Extra Stories. And this is the story of dubstep. I haven't got a clue what's going on. I'm Mr Jam and I'm a dubstep junkie. From the dirty, wobbly bass lines of Rusko to the heavyweight sounds of Digital Mystics to Scream's remix of In For The Kill by LaRue to the nastiest of Dr P drops. Switch up. I can't get enough bass in my face. So when did you get into dubstep? Was it Magnetic Man this year that turned you onto the sound? Did you start to take notice in 2008 when dubstep exploded out of the UK underground to take on the world and even US artists like Snoop and Rihanna were getting in on the act? Maybe like me, it was the Burial Album or Benga and Koki's Night in 2007. Or was it back when the legendary DMZ night started in Brixton in 2005? Were you one of the original heads up forward right when it all began? Wherever you entered the game, like me, you are probably addicted to sub bass. This is a special two-part show charting the frankly meteoric rise of dubstep over the last 10 years. For the next hour, we'll be speaking to the likes of Scream, Benga, Artwork, Hatcher and Plastician about where it all came from and how the fledgling scene grew. Next week, we'll continue the journey, catching up again with Magnetic Man and talking to Katie B, Pinch and the Bristol crew and Rusko as our dubstep soldiers march right round the planet. But to start off, we're going to take it right back to its roots, before the word dubstep even existed. Rewind to the late 90s, early noughties, an old school UK garage is in full swing with acts like So Solid Crew, Pays Your Go Cartel and the Heartless Crew storming the charts. But not everyone was feeling this swing and bling vibe. It was a breakaway crew stroke click of DJs and producers who were hooked on deeper, darker, sometimes dubbier sounds. Introducing two of the godfathers of dubstep. LB and Oris J. It kind of came along like a wave, really. You couldn't ignore it, do you know what I mean? It's LB, Ghost Records, and we're here taking you through the story of dubstep. dubstep. There was a small bunch of us that start, kick-started it all. The first ones to put out records were Zed Bias, me, and the Ghost Boys. Uh, and then came Oris J and Zinc. There was a community building. There was a little crew called Ammunition. Like Ammunition Limited. This is Oris J, aka Dark One. LB, Jameson, Sovereign, Horsepower, Wookie, Steve Gurley. These were all the sort of people that was in that sort of clique at the time. If you ended up sort of rolling with the Ammunition lot, then it was classed as you were one of the boys who was making the tunes. All doing their own thing, all making their own sound. And the only thing that sort of kept us sort of classed as the same genre really was they all had bass and it was all about the same tempo. 
because I was deep in the drum and bass scene, you know what I mean, knocking around with Clifford Goldie and Dillinger and all the boys there, Lemon and all that. Coming from that background, I suppose it was hard to just simply adjust to all the um, flowers and chocolate boy style garage, you know what I mean? So uh, that was just uh, customising it to how I felt comfortable, that's all. Cool, cool. In 1999, I didn't actually know how to make tunes, so the tunes that I was making, which sound like dubstep now, is just where it sounds like stripped down tunes all about the bass. My tunes sounded stripped down about the bass because I couldn't make them any better than that anyway. That darker sound was really what attracted me to Garage at the time. That was the sort of sound that I was really into. Plastician, producer, DJ, also run a record label, Terror Rhythm Recordings. If you listen to things like Stone Cold by Groove Chronicles or 99 by um, LB, even like Zeb Bias, Neighbourhood. I feel good, good, good. I feel good, yes, wonderful, good. If you listen to that, it sounds real similar to some of the dubstep that, that's being made and played now. I feel good, good, good. I feel good, yes, wonderful, good. Still sounding fresh. I actually still play that out at dances today and it still goes off. Let's get more of a flavour of those stripped down darker sounds. Here's a classic from LB called Express on the Ghost Label. Check out the bass when it drops. Ooh, so we never fucking get, 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 get. 
to the story of dubstep on Radio 1 and 1 Extra with me, Mr. Jam. So people always want to know, what was the first dubstep track? Well, sorry, it doesn't exist. But you could say that in the productions of Zed Bias, Oris J and LB with this track Express, you can hear the beginnings of what we now call dubstep. So on to the next link in the dubstep chain, Big Apple Records, the record shop where a couple of truanting teenagers, Benny, aka Benga, and Ollie, aka Scream, first met Arthur, aka Artwork, and started making beats. The setup of Big Apple Records was a record shop in a fruit market in Croydon. Hello, I'm Artwork from Magnetic Man, owned by John Kennedy. And DJ Hatcher used to work there. I had a recording studio at the top of the building. But the whole place was a weird kind of like college of music, really. Introducing Hatcher, DJ formerly from Rents, now on Kiss and big in the game. I was working in Big Apple Records in Croydon. You know, I was a garage DJ, playing at garage raves and buying drum and bass records and stuff. And um, people would just come, you know, like Oris J and LB, Horsepower, Zed Bias, Futuristics, Scream, Benga, Casper. Who else was coming in? Mala. Mala used to MC for me at like Twice As Nice and La Cosa Nostra and Garage Fever, Coke, Kilo. For all these people were young coming in. <laughs> My brother used to work in the Scream and Banger. First time I ever went in, I was about 12 and I was with my mum and I walked in and actually was did after working there I found out I did the most annoying thing. I went in, asked for the highest record, asked to hear it, and then they said, Do you want it? I was like, no, unless. <laughs> I can actually remember doing the same coming in with my mum and um, asking for like Cali weed. You just wanted to hear, you just wanted to hear it, really. You know I just wanted I mean? to hear it and then be like, "Don't want to buy it." I remember just walking out and seeing John go, <laughs> "Scream and Benga, cool." I could start and be here all day about them two troublemakers, um, blinding kids, wicked, really nice kids growing up really talented in the studio you know they was when they got into their producing when they was like 14 15 they was produced 13 even 12 13 they was producing on playstation there was a program come out called music 2000 and they was making their music on there first bringing it in on mini discs and tape me this were cool at the time yeah. they'd just come out it was like cutting edge technology yeah. that lasted 10 minutes we it's didn't have burn CDs either like we didn't know about burning CDs no you couldn't how could we like we couldn't get Playstation music onto CD could yeah. you yeah and you had to like record it like almost analog style so we actually have to take uh, all the decks out so we could plug this mini disc thing in and then play us the track and we sort of stand there and then you know we play it again and the first ones were shady, shady. within a year we were like we could put these records out you know this is and not just put this record out this is the best sounding record out there at the moment you know Hatcher arguably the original dubstep DJ I was kind of the only person there playing everyone's sound in one set Plastician. I would stand at the back of the shop, speak to Hatcher every now and then, just listen to the records that were being played. That was also kind of what spurred me on to produce myself. As soon as I made a track, I thought, should I play this one to Hatcher in the shop, or is this not really... Am I going to be embarrassed to play this in front of people in the shop? So it was good, because it kind of... It moulded... It definitely moulded the sound, you know, like... If I was making something I, I thought might get laughed out of the shop, I would never have played it to anyone. You'd make a track for him, or he'd, you know, he'd beg you to to make something, you know. So you you'd make something for him, and then 
he'd come back and say see that I want that exactly the same but I want it more like this and like I want this sound in there I want that bass you know he was quite specific about what exactly he wanted and uh, he was right with a lot of it you know I was kind of saying yeah we want this we want that get darker get more tribal on it and stuff because at the time it was really dub orientated if it wasn't for the music I don't know what we'd do you know the music stepped in and saved my life just wanted to out dark everybody or out he just wanted to just be just his character you know he wants to have the best dub plates the darkest dub plates the, the you, you know it's always I his face how happy he was when DJ Narrows it's called Burning if it wasn't for the music I don't know what we did yeah. the music stepped in and that was the darkest record I've yeah. ever heard at the time yeah you know the music stepped in and saved my life if it wasn't for the music, I don't know what we'd do. And I remember him playing it with the happiest face on to this really dark tune. He was like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Artwork Red, you know, Benga Skank. Um, all of these were early stuff that was made kind of, you know, when the two-step era was at its peak. I was incorporating it in all my sets on radio and out in clubs and stuff everyone that was making that kind of sound would bring it down to the record shop and I was saying yeah I like this I like that change this and change that yes, yes. and it kind of all just kind of stuck from there really it was a good nice little tight family we had running down there so the way it worked in the family was that you'd bring your tunes down to Big Apple Records to play to Hatcher. If he was into them, he'd get them cut into a dub plate to play out in one of his sets. Now, dub plates were cheaper and quicker than pressing a vinyl record, but producers only got a handful of copies pressed up, and they didn't last long. You can only play them about 50 times before they get completely mashed up. And more importantly, they were usually unreleased tracks or remixes and exclusives, which meant the DJs were battling each other to get hold of them. Oris J. Actually, kind of didn't really give you no choice, to be honest, because he would phone you every 25 minutes, maybe throughout the whole day until he got the tune. So you didn't, it actually didn't really give you a choice. He sort of forced you to get it to him <laughs> by ringing your phone every 10 minutes until he got it. I was quite embarrassed to give Hatcher my tunes because he was playing this really kind of dark, he was playing the like horsepower, like scream and benga, that kind of stuff. I was kind of leaning a little bit more towards the grime side of things. Slimzy was a really big DJ at the time for like grime, particularly for instrumental grime. Hatcher got wind of Slimzy's playing one of my tunes. Hatcher was like, how come you haven't given me this tune? Like, why haven't I got this? I need some beats off you. And then uh, the first one I remember giving him was a track called Hard Graft. And he loved it. And he was like, don't give this to Slimzy. Let me have this one. Yeah, I was a bit of a tosser. Yeah, I was like, you know, if, I, if I've got this, no one else can have it kind of thing, which is good. It's still the same today. I like to have exclusivity on everything because I don't want to get on the decks and play a track that's already been played four times before me or the DJ before me's just played. Obviously, there's a couple of tracks in the bag that are the big ones that everyone's going to drop. But... I'm still the same now as I was then. I've, if I get saying you've got to give me a couple of months rinse on it before um, you start handing it out. So I thought I'd take the opportunity here to play one of Benger and Scream's early productions, making full use of the Fruity Loops software. Now, this one came out on Big Apple Records in 2003. Very nearly didn't see the light of day as they lost a load of tunes when Benger's hard drive crashed.
and scream the judgment massive tune now ask anyone where dubstep came from and they're guaranteed to mention forward forward basically simply forward started it off at that time it was just about making a tune that was going to go off forward because there was nowhere else playing it i mean i remember being at forward when literally there'd be 10 people there everyone just be looking at the dub plates just wanting to know what the next tune is it was kind of like this urban geek society it was a lot of uh, chin strokers you know they would spend their next couple of months searching the country to try and find what you was playing the club night forward spelled fwd if you're googling it was originally held at the velvet rooms in london soho and it was the place to hear the darker garage sounds produced by lb zed bias and oris j and championed by dj hatcher I wanted something different, you know, I love the garage music and it was horrible to actually, you had so many people turning up to these massive events and there was so much atmosphere. You'd have like 30 MCs battling for the mic, you couldn't even hear the music. You'd have fights kicking off left, right and centre in the crowd. And then it got to a stage where you was going to garage events, there was no women in the club because it, it, it wasn't that kind of fire. There was all men there and attitude and I was like, you know, this ain't my cup of tea. And I'm playing this more deeper stuff and I'm putting that in my sets and the crowd wasn't even really feeling some of the deeper stuff. So it was kind of a lifeline when Forward started. If it wasn't for Forward, there wouldn't really kind of be no dubstep. It was all well and good, you know, me playing it first and all the producers bringing in the music and doing it, but if we had nowhere to play it, so, you know, 
we owe a lot to old Sarah Lockhart because she started the first night and it was somewhere for us all to go. And of course, the Magnetic Man trio, Benga Scream and Artwork were all there in the early days. It was a weird place. It was like in the Velvet Room, wasn't it? So it was a... Uh, it was still a lot of the garage crowds. Well. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that building's there anymore. It's gone, isn't it? Now? It was just, it was kind of like a quite garagey crowd. Still some garagey records being played. Still black, black buying champagne. Still buying champagne. Sunglasses. Still sunglasses in, at night, you know. But there were tracks there that were all... I'll tell you what. Go on. being played then. A pay-as-you-go record called Champagne Dance. Yeah. <laughs> That was when there was girls there as well for a while. Um, <laughs> they went after it got a bit darker. But the first ones were, they were more, uh, they were sort of like the very tail end of Garage into when Garage started to get dark and started to get smart. Yeah. Music was getting darker and darker and then they all sort of just left. And it, it become a bit of a geek thing for a minute. Yeah. At the time, it was a very train yeah train spotty crowd. Like pens and pa- like pens and pads out, like writing the song names down and stuff. Everybody what was playing was a producer, and they was only actually either playing their own tunes or they were playing the mates' tunes what were in the room anyway, who were also producers. So you're hearing your tunes out loud, so you can actually really we were looking at and we can check what the mix down's like on the track to see if it needs less bass or more bass or more higher. So it was almost like um, it was like a training ground for the producers. <laughs> Some of the dub plates they're doing in there, it was literally just made for that night, just to test out. They might not have liked, the producer who made it might not have liked it, so then that never saw the, the light of day ever again. So you would hear remixes of tunes that you'd never hear again. Well, I think the first time we ever went to forward at Velvet Rooms is when I had the first cut scan, can we listen to that out first? I'm not sure. No, no, it won't scan, it was Dose. Dose. Yeah. There you go. I feel like I got my first full tracksuit. Like, <laughs> I, I remember, oh, you remember, yeah, do you remember yeah, I the first full Nike Air tracksuit? Yeah. That's well young then, well young. Just hitting 14 at max. It was just like a club of mates. Even if you didn't really know them, you just meet them that night, and then because you're obviously making a similar music, it's like you was automatically mates. Could you compare it to a youth club? <laughs> Legally, no. <laughs> we all travelled up in like limos, like so cliche, but yeah, we all travelled up in limos together. Limos? Huh? I'll explain. Yeah, please do artwork. As you can imagine, there's loads of us in Apple and we have to go to Ford every week and to get all of us in cabs was going to cost an absolute fortune and it was much cheaper to get one limo and get 20 of us in it to go up to Ford because then he'd wait for you, then he'd come back and it only cost you like 15 quid each. In the limo I was sat in, I only knew a couple of the people. There was like 10 of us in it. That's kind of how I met a lot of people. Early days of Forward, I'd turn up to Forward with 10 CDs, come home with like 20 CDs. It was almost like legal tender. Like, you couldn't really get tunes unless you had something to offer back. So that was something else that got me into production. I was like, I need some exclusive tracks for my DJ sets. I'm not getting them unless I've got something to offer in return. Old school kind of like trading. I like look now like a lot of stuff is on YouTube and stuff that I'm like, how has anyone got that? But when you look back, like they were probably passing them CDs of mine on to other people. Right, so you had Big Apple Record Shop in Croydon, South London, where producers and DJs were hanging out and developing the sound. Then forward, the Central London Club, where they were testing out the dub plates on the sound system and swapping their tracks. But who was releasing these records? Well, you had Big Apple Records, of course, linked to the shop, and loads of producers had their own labels. But the one label which laid the foundations for dubstep as we know it was Temper. It was hugely important in defining the sound. has been putting out landmark records for the last 10 years with no signs of stopping. The Dubstep All-Star series, Scream's first album, Benga's first album, the record that grabbed me into the scene, Benga and Koki's Night. But here's their second ever 12, which came out in 2000. It's Horsepower Productions' Gorgon Sound. Oh, 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 
Cause when it comes to music is we are the go 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 Sound, an early release on seminal dubstep label Temper. Pretty much the dubstep label to start with. It was the first one. Pinch coming out of Bristol. Temper and then Soldier, Horsepower. Primarily because nearly every release on Temper for the first sort of dozen releases was all Horsepower, pretty much. Horsepower was a huge influence on everyone. It was, you know, the kind of sample scape and atmospherics and kind of rolling rhythms. It was... Uh, yeah, it was the fundamental building block from it, where it all came from. It was this kind of new two-steppy sound, but with really dubby um, bass lines and kind of lots of samples thrown in and quite atmospheric, quite clever. Benny Hill from Horsepower used to make sort of electro kind of techno stuff, and he'd come into the shop and we'd be making very dark garage, stripped down sort of, you know, where it was grime and it was a bit of garage and it was a bit kind of all over the place and he sort of said I want to make some of this and he came in with sort of like a garage sort of two step beats but where he loved dub he was putting loads of dub samples in there and putting the snares on the wrong beats so at first we were like whoa Ben you know this is mental but Hatcher loved it you know that's kind of style started with Ben Hill Benny Hill. When we started, I guess you could call what we were making garage, really, and uh, we just made it in a different style to what other people were doing, just for originality, really, and people took up on that and decided, well, it ain't really garage, it's a different music, so that's how they coined the term in the first place. You know, they wanted to find uh, a good name to fit to the genre. Talking of names, the million-dollar question... How and when did dubstep become dubstep? I remember when um, people were still trying to kind of name it, like, because we had grime at the time as well, like, which was pretty much like stripped down instrumental garage. Sublo was like Johnny Cash, them guys, they tried, they they put flyers and stuff out saying this is called Sublo. I liked Sublo, I thought that was a good name. 
it says what I'd I'd like to hear, you know. But I think it never stuck because it was sort of associated with uh, that uh, element of the Johnny Cash Black Ops Grime. And at the time, all the Grime lot were kind of everyone was trying to call it their own thing. So this is Esky, this is Sublo. No, it's Eight Bar. It's all the same. For a while, it was called Raggage. You remember when I was calling yeah. it Raggage? Yeah. And it was like when the first time I was looking on forums and online. Yeah, it's ragged, sounds like disease, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I kept getting labelled forward beats because of the night forward. Forward is a night, it's not a sound, do you know, like, but people were using the term forward beats a lot. And then I heard tech step because people were like, it's like techno, it's like two step. But that one didn't last very long. The Reflex Grime album came out in 2004 and everyone's looking at it. That's not even grime. Grime's vocal music, for starters, is you know, how wrong can you get it? And then they put this big long rant on the back of the vinyl, saying, you know, sublo, eight bar, esky beat, dubstep, grime. We're just going to call it grime. Get done. Well, well, that's nice of you. You know, off you go, have fun. Um, no one else is. <laughs> I remember sitting in the room, actually, when the word dubstep first got used ever. It was with a guy called Neil, who used to co-run ammunition, actually, with Sarah. And I remember they was talking about one of Ben Neil's tracks, and they said, it's kind of like two-step, in it? But it's like dub as well. It's kind of like dubstep. Like, and from that day onwards, anything that Ben Neil did was called dubstep. I think there was a definitive article in Accelerator magazine, an American mag, in 2002, where the sort of name dubstep was implanted in the in the psyche. So that was I kind of became aware of it then. I remember chatting to people, and it's like maybe we should have a better name than dubstep. It is a bit kind of bland. It's like no, nah, well, you know what? The the ethos of what dubstep means, the step, I guess, coming from the two step, the garagey kind of side of things, and dub meaning the kind of instrumental exploration of like a deep space rather than just straight up. Here's a reggae sample. This is dubstep. You know, I, I still kind of like the ethos of that. And I think it's open. It doesn't have to be any one thing. It could be, like, different tempos. It's just something with a kind of dub vibe. Thanks, Pinch. You pretty much laid it down there. I like to blow myself, but I've grown to love dubstep. I know, I know, I know. This is the story of dubstep on Radio 1 and 1 Extra. So far in the story, we've been focusing on the Magnetic Man Boys. Or should that be Magnetic Man Men? Anyway, also on the scene in the early days were the DMZ Collective. Mala, Koki, Lofa and Sergeant Pokes. Let's change the vibe up with one of their best known tracks, Anti-War Dub.
Little Mystics anti-war dub from 2006. Digital Mystics, aka Mala and Koki, along with Lofa and MC Sergeant Pokes, brought new influences into the scene. They grew up on jungle, reggae and dub and the whole sound system culture. It's funny when I look back because DMZ, it became an extension of our bedrooms really, you know, where it was just nice that we were able to share what we were doing in our bedrooms to more and more people. Mala, Digital Mystics, DMZ and Deep Medi. Myself and Koki and Pokes, when we were younger, we all used to MC. We used to MC at like like under 18 jungle raves when we were kids, and there'd be parties on in our area every weekend. So we'd go to the parties and you know we'd go and MC, and that's how it was. And then when we got to uh, 16, that's when we met Lofa. We set up like a little crew, and we'd jam in our bedroom and make mixtapes and play at parties. The same thing. Dubstep wasn't a thing that existed. It was something that, I'm not saying that we created dubstep. What I'm saying is that we just created a vibe that we were feeling from a very a young age, you know? And it's something that just continued, it didn't stop. And that's probably why we were all very strong friends. At the root of it, there was a, a very uh, a very strong common musical love. Me and Koki went down to Big Apple Records with a couple of records that we made. And that was like, I can play this. And we were like, what, you can play it? And he's like, yeah, 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 I can play it at this dance forward, da, 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 da. You know how Hatcher is. Anyway, he cut dub plates, he played the records, and it was one of those mad things that you could never imagine that would happen to you. But people actually responded to the music. And it was very strange because I didn't think people would ever dance to the type of music that I was making because I didn't think it was dance music. I'd already done some other stuff in the music industry, and that was a massive eye-opener. I wasn't interested in signing any record deals with anybody or anything like that. That kind of gave me the fire to want to set up my own thing. It wasn't like I was against anything, like I wanted to start war, but I didn't like a lot of the music that I was hearing. The whole kind of like bling bling garage thing had finally died, like hooray, because that was just turning into a mess, you know what I mean? I wasn't trying to be a, a, a pop star, I wasn't trying to make music that made people like want to wear glamorous clothes and drink champagne and all that. And even now I don't think my music is designed to be played daytime on a radio station, it's just not that type of sound. I don't even think that my music is necessarily designed to be listened to on radio. It's, I feel still now it's a sound system sound. I'm Mr Jam taking you through the story of dubstep on BBC Radio 1 and 1 Extra. I know that you've all been prepared, been prepared for this, but I thought I just thought I'd remind you just to The dubstep scene was building momentum. By 2004, Scream, Benga and Mala were all establishing themselves as dubstep DJs, as were the likes of Pinch and the Bristol Contingent. Other labels had popped up alongside Temper, Hot Flush, Hyperdub, Code Nine's label and DMZ. And by this time, Forward had moved from the Velvet Rooms to Thursday night at Plastic People, a bigger venue in East London. There's one other thing. No one is to to leave this room. 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 And another night, Filthy Dub, run by Plastician, was pushing the sound. But there was still no big weekend club night for the growing scene. That's where DMZ crew came in. I consider myself, I guess, part of the second generation, really. The DMZ generation who came upon dubstep for the very first time in 2005. This is Marianne Hobbs, notorious dubstep evangelist on BBC Radio 1. I got this brand new record from an artist called DJ Pinch in Bristol. It was called War Dub and it completely changed my life. That was the moment at which I really truly discovered dubstep. But at that point, I've got absolutely no idea what this sound was. I remember being on the top deck of a bus in London and driving through the East End, speaking to Pinch about this incredible new sound. And he dispatched me off to DMZ for the very first time and said, this is the place where you'll find this music. It's called dubstep. Sometimes other symptoms of a similar nature. I got addicted to listening to that type of sound. So, you know, all the early Scream stuff, Code 9, Benga, even my own music. I was addicted to hearing it on such a big sound system where you could really feel it. Because it changed from being something that was just mental to something very physical as well. And it just luckily, um, a Saturday night free slot at the venue came about. I think someone called Low. And he was like, yeah, there's a free night. Just come up at a venue called Third Base, which is part of the mass. And it was just all spare of the moment, you know. I think we went the next week to have a look at the venue on the Wednesday. When we walked into that room, it was just like, this is it. 
It takes place in this fantastic, grimy environment in Brixton Town. And when you walk into the room, there's absolutely nothing there. It's pitch black. All you see is a couple of giant speaker stacks with these incredible subs at the bottom. Went back to Lowe's, we designed the flyer very minimal because we were representing ourselves and what we stood for and we didn't let really anybody else get involved in that representation you come to our dance we didn't have on our flyer this is this music or that music come and check it out it's bass music da, 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 da. we didn't have none of that I remember on all their early flyers they used to have this amazing strap line that just said come meditate on bass weight and that kind of just sums the whole experience up really we just had the DJ's names and we had Come meditate on bass weight. We had the door price, the time it starts, the address of where it was, and that was it. DMZ is always a banging night to play at. Always good. You know, they won't just stick on a mishmash of everyone and all the big names and what's hot now. They will stick to their roots and play what is relevant. If you know you're booked for DMZ, you have to have something that no one's heard before. You wouldn't just turn up with your with your regular sort of Saturday night record box. You would have to have something no one's heard before in your life. It's almost like that's the entry fee for a DJ to go in. <laughs> like, literally, you've just made it and that's the reason you were five minutes late for your set because you were burning the CD in the car on the way there. Everyone who was going there at the start it was like to support Digital Mystics and who was putting on this night. I don't think a lot of people knew actually at the start what they were going to hear. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was. It did become one of the most important nights for me. I never thought people would come, but it wasn't about people coming. It was about us doing. I felt like we had so much fire and so much energy. It didn't matter what anybody else was doing. We just wanted to do our thing and we wanted to do it our way. Once you've walked through the doors of DMZ and you've crossed that threshold, within 10 minutes, you'll either be completely converted and you will be worshipping at the shrine of dubstep or you'll be running for your life. <laughs> There's kind of no intermediate reaction whatsoever, really. Well, we're all worshipping at the Shrine of Dubstep now. In 2005, along with the start of DMZ, there was another groundbreaking moment that was to bring dubstep to the ears of unsuspecting clubbers everywhere. Pretty much whatever scene they were into. Screen released Midnight Request Line. It makes all the hairs on the back of my neck stand up the first time I hear that kind of, you know, the click of the phone. The story he told me was that he was just kind of bored one Christmas day, I think Christmas day or Boxing Day, just kicked the tune out for fun in his bedroom, didn't think anything of it and literally buried it for a year before he'd actually decided to do anything with it. When I'd done it, I didn't think nothing of it. I actually gave it to Hatcher and he didn't like it. When Oliver first played it to me, I was like, hmm, bit of a strange one. And I thought, oh no, uh, oh. It's like, like the first track he didn't play on mine. Yeah. And then I passed it over to Youngster and he played it one night with... When all the grime MCs were and else went mental. And Youngster dropped it at full and I was like, now that actually does sound fat on the system. So I was like, actually, Ollie, I think I do need to actually cut that plate. It was a good feeling. It was like the first sort of step in world domination.
probably the first dubstep tune to sell over like 5,000 copies on vinyl and that was mind-blowing at the time. A lot of these people were playing Midnight Request and I never heard of dubstep. They just heard the tune and thought, this works in my set, so I'm playing it. Almost every single Radio 1 Specialist DJ was absolutely battering that tune. I think Plastician was on air at that point. Rob DeBank, Charles Peterson, Ras Kwame, me. Everybody just fell head over heels in love with Midnight Request Line. It was the first one that I, I was getting played on, not on Pirate, like, and hearing stories of like Ricardo Villalobos playing it. I didn't even know Ricardo from the low boss, so I didn't realise what people were telling me, that importance he was playing it. The like, first time I heard it was on my friend's phone, and it was like, it was musical. And it was, before then, he was making like one note bass lines and no, no melodies over the top of it. I think everyone got a bit more up for it, like it was almost a bit more drive. Once Midnight and Request Line come out, we had like, a goal. Dubstep can do things. You're listening to the story of Dubstep on Radio 1 and 1 Extra with me, Mr Jam. Back to Digital Mystic's DMZ night. Their first birthday party turned out to be a landmark moment in Dubstep history. Here's Mala. We've been going on for a year and at the first event there was like 150, 200 people and at the second event there was 300 and it was like raw every time the new DMZ was on more people was coming down. And then March came, which was our first birthday. And I just remember thinking that, oh, uh, a little bit unsure about how, how the night's going to be. As I still am now, I'm always unsure how it's going to be. I'm never sure how many people are going to turn up, you know. And I remember going outside and seeing this queue, and I was like, whoa, 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 that people are actually here. And not just the one or two people, there's already a lot of people here. There was like a thousand people outside queuing up, like from all over the world, like not just England either, there was people from over from America, it was just like, wow, what, I remember looking at Mallory and he was just like, what, what do I do? The club owner was like, you know you might have to, we might have to do something, you might have to move. You know, I was like, nah, we're not going to have to move, it's, there's a lot of people there, but it's not that many, it's just a lot for a small party, you know. Within an hour of opening, we was at full capacity. The little basement room that they used to use at the church in Brixton was just heaving, absolutely heaving at the seams. And there were still people turning up. So the club owner was like, look, we've got the big room upstairs if you want to take it. So he went upstairs, quickly tried to sound check, got the room ready, and I remember going on the mic and I said to the people something like, look, thanks for coming down, blah, 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 blah. I said, look, all of us lot are right because we're all inside. I said, but there's another like four or five hundred people outside that can't get in. So I don't know what you lot are saying, but if you don't mind, do you want to join us upstairs and we make this party bigger? And everyone just like went mad. And then luckily there was a stair, there's a stairway that goes from third base up into the mass. We just opened up the door and Youngster started off the set upstairs and that was it. It was insane. It was a really, really memorable night. It was a really good time. There was so much good music at the time as well. Like she just got a bit goose pimply. It just felt like this amazing threshold had been crossed in that moment. It was a wonderful moment. It was a real kind of coming of age for them, I think. So we're going to leave the story here this week with Dubstep poised to take off in 2006 and become the monster it is today. It's just different to all of the other stuff that's been played over the last few years. It's new, love it. Tasty status. Magnetic man. Tasty status. <laughs> Magnetic man, he's good. Screaming Benga. Um, artwork, yeah, who else? That's pretty much it, really. We've just come back from a season in Ibiza and like just like dubstep. Yeah, New Row, it's, uh, it's blowing up out there, so yeah, it's cool. Reclaim a dance floor, everyone played dubstep like Annie Mac, Nero, Scratch Perverts. Who else played? Jaguar Skills. Next, Marianne Hobbs' Dubstep War show brings dubstep to fresh ears. I just felt that there was a flashpoint about to happen, and I really, really just wanted to try to capture some of this incredible, intense raw energy of this emerging scene. It blows up globally in 2007, 2008 with US act Snoop and Pharrell getting on board. If Snoop Dogg asked me to make tunes for him, I would say leave the dubstep thing alone and I'll make you some hip-hop stuff because you don't suit dubstep, mate. Then we arrive at 2010 with dubstep all over the charts and the mighty magnetic man coming into their own. We wanted to make a sort of something a little bit more 
strange, a little bit more electronic and take a bit, you know, take a few risks. A lot of people were playing it, a lot of people liked it. And then we said, uh, we could do this, we could do this, we could make it light. On the story of dubstep, we discovered how the music evolved from dark garage sounds of the early noughties. I suppose it was hard to just simply adjust to all the um, flowers and chocolate boy style garage, you know what I mean? So uh, that was just uh, customising it to how I felt comfortable, that's all. How Magnetic Man met at the legendary Big Apple Records in Croydon. The whole place was a weird kind of, like, college of music, really. And how it all came together at one London club night. Forward, basically. Simply Forward started it off. At that time, it was just about making a tune that was going to go off at Forward, because there was nowhere else playing it. I'm Mr Jam, and you're listening to part two of The Story of Dubstep on Radio 1 and 1 Extra. We'll be catching up with Magnetic Man, KTB and Rusko and checking out scenes across the globe. But first, back to the early days. Dubstep may have been born in South London, but it wasn't just the Croydon Massive who were feeling the sound. There was another city where the heads just couldn't get enough sub bass. Eyes to the West Country. I'm from South East London, but I moved on to Bristol because of the music vibe. Bristol's always had a great relationship with bass. Smith and Mighty and more rockers and Ronnie Sides represent and, you know, Massive Attack, Tricky and Portishead. There's always been something which has got this kind of, like, dark, trippy element to it. Something that's quite sort of sound system culture. It's got a certain kind of moodiness to it. Back in the day, dubstep was, you know, absolutely about bass lines. It was the, the second city where there was a large concentration of artists all focusing on the music. Like everyone knows everyone, and so it creates a massive community. All the producers and MCs and everybody in Bristol pretty much live like in the same like maybe two, three mile radius. So everyone works together, all the dubstep artists in particular. It's the centre of the dubstep world. I would tell all the credit in heads, but yeah, you should come to Bristol still. Bristol's pretty much established as dubstep's second city these days. But what was it that kick-started the scene? Through visiting dubblake.net, we heard of this night called Forward. And it was only once a month in London. Dickon, as some people know, is DJ Thinking, run a label called Black Box. I went down with some of the guys from Multiverse, actually, with Pinch, with Gins, and with Fids, who was usually doing the driving. We were all kind of finding our feet at the same time, and we were all making the monthly mission in, in Fids' old Peugeot. For the very first time. I'd heard a couple of tunes before that, but I hadn't heard music in the context of... You know, where you're supposed to hear it. And the only place it existed in the world was at Forward on a, at that time, the first Thursday of the month. Pinch, coming out of Bristol, representing Tectonic, subloaded and all things good in Bristol. When our rocket ship explodes. We drove up from Bristol to hear Code 9 play specifically, actually. I remember it going in to this sort of small venue. I remember seeing the dance floor in pitch black, people standing around, not really doing very much. And I kind of thought, what's going on here, you know? And after about 10, 15 minutes stood on the dance floor, just got totally lost in it and became another one of the nodding zombies. Hearing dubstep and hearing this really minimal sound, it's like I'm actually listening to every sound in the tune. And this is an experience, whereas when you've got a really busy track, it just kind of washes over. You can't really pick out what's going on so much. It's kind of like a real charge on the senses, if you like, whereas this was a very different kind of thing you kind of got to hear what was going on it wasn't long before bristol got its own night to be honest i've never really wanted to be a promoter if someone else had come and set up forward in bristol i would have just gone to it and i've been happy with that but you know no one was so 
I wanted it here that bad. <laughs> I thought, you know, I like, I like going up to Ford and everything, but it'd be nice not to have to do that two and a half hour drive back at two in the morning. So um, I just wanted to set up home here, really. Pinch has always been sort of a quiet grafter. He was just like, you know, scheming and plotting away at home and then just said, right, you know, let's just do a night. Let's just do something, you know. I think he took a lot of inspiration from seeing DMZ. I can't remember it, actually, on the old dubplate.net forum, Loafer just popping up and saying, right, we're not having it anymore, we've, we've got a room and some speakers and we're just going to do it, we're just going to do our night because no one else wants to do it. And I think Pinch had the same kind of attitude, he's like, you know, I'll borrow some speakers so we can have some decent bass and we'll just go down the local club and do something for ourselves. The very first night, when it, before it was a purist dubstep night, Pinch was running a thing called Context. And the very first one, I remember us going down there and discovering at 6pm that the night before they'd blown the sound system up. So we had to run around quickly to get some more speakers, uh, because I was playing the first set. It was very much like early doors, there was not, not a lot of people that were interested or knew what we were doing. The amount of people interested in it was obviously a lot smaller as well, and you know there wasn't the money to put on the kind of budgets that these sort of lineups would would ask for now. But people were keen to kind of come and and play, and there was a, a real sense of community spirit, for want of a better way of putting it. It's like, okay, well look, it's a sofa for you and a couple hundred quid. Are you cool with that? And they're like, yeah, that will do me. Green. Bristol was one of the first places I went outside London to a dubstep show. We've been friends with Pinch since since his first night in Bristol. Like, and I've, we've got loads of mates up there. It's the party capital for me of the country. Like, we've done remixes for Pinch, we've released on Tectonic, you know. It's always been nothing but love, really. Pinch put on his, the kind of definitive night in 2005, in April, which was the second of his subloaded nights, uh, which is the Black Swan and used quite a famous sound system in Bristol at the time called Dissident, which is like a free party rig, but really, really well built. It had grown to that stage where I could do it in a bigger venue and, you know, it wasn't like an enormous, massive audience with a sellout kind of show, but it was, it was a wicked night and it was busy and I didn't lose any money, so it was like, great. It was just next level compared to anything we'd had in Bristol before. I mean, you know, the, the bass was ridiculous. You were kind of getting breathing problems in your windpipe because you couldn't sort of, like, stand the bass. A lot of people who took a lot of new heads down there as well, so that was uh, one of the points where everyone really got it. I was in my drum and bass. <laughs> I had my blinkers on. Hello, I'm Jake from Bristol. I can't even remember what tune I heard down there when I went down there. It was just popping. And I was like, ah, oh, rah, rah. That's nice. Yeah, I just never looked back. And like London, Bristol started its own crop of labels to showcase the talent coming out of the city. <laughs> Pinch had his tectonic label running by then, so the first few releases were creeping out and people were sort of noticing that this was the first really serious label outside of London that was doing things and making moves. Peverless with his Punch Drunk label is another sort of a big statement, like this is our thing and it is different from what happens in Croydon and South London. It's, it's, it's a Bristol thing and it's Bristol people doing it. I've kind of been playing about with kind of making music in my bedroom for a few years. Peverellist, DJ, producer and a label owner based in Bristol. I kind of decided to have a go at it seriously around um, 2005-ish. What really inspired me to make beats was um, I was living with Pinch and he started making tunes and he was getting some recognition for the tunes that he was making and for dubs he was, he was passing around. And um, it was just a competitive thing, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, I can have a go at that too. I started Punch Drunk in, it must have been around 2006. Certainly the dances in Bristol were, were getting popular and a lot of people that I knew were making music were getting inspired by dubstep and doing their own version. So I started Punch Drunk as an outlet for the kind of people I knew from Bristol who were making beats to kind of get their beats out to the wider world. But it wasn't just Bristol labels repping the Bristol sound. Experimental electronic music label Planet New had an ear on what was going on and went on to release one of the seminal tracks out of Bristol. That was the first big dubstep record out of Bristol, it was Quali. I kind of made it, it's a kind of late night tune for me, I just would sit there working on it, just looping up, I, you know, burning the midnight oil and burning a few other things, but I kind of really never thought anyone would be particularly interested in it and... Mike from Planet Mew called me up and said, I've heard about this track, can I hear it? So I sent it over, he's like, love it, I'm going to put it out. <laughs> I was like, cool. What? He's like, yeah, I'm going to press a thousand vinyls. I was like, a thousand vinyls? Are you mad? He's going to buy them. It went on to do really well, it was kind of really surprising. It was a nice way to set foot. It's like the second dubstep tune I ever made. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Bristol-based artist Pinch with Quali. And we'll return to the Bristol scene later in the show. This is radio control. Back to the story. In 2005, the dubstep scene was building momentum with club nights like Pinch's Subloaded in Bristol and the Digital Mystics crew DMZ Night in Brixton. Mala. I was addicted to hearing it on such a big sound system where you could really feel it because it changed from being something that was just mental to something very physical as well. But it wasn't just clubbers that spread the word. Radio played a big part in pushing the sound. Now, we couldn't tell the story of dubstep without a nod to the London pirate station, Rinse. Here's Entai. When you go to the Rinse studio, you're looking at, like, a little secret location somewhere, like, but obviously, like, when everyone's on the decks and that vibe, and <laughs> you can hear it down the, down the hallway or outside when you're pulling up. <laughs> Basically, it was just a room inside a room. So we go in there, we come in through one door, graffiti and all that stuff, like, everywhere, you know, that kind of vibe. And then you've got, like, a half-decent little studio, like, carpet on the wall, a mixer which looked like it had been rinsed because everyone was <laughs> m- mashing it up I think every time everyone's vibing out it's just like playing in a dance really when you go to rinse it's kind of like playing in a dance banger, horses galloping through the studio horse banger pots and pans Plastician I think rinse is huge hugely important to the success and the rise of dubstep Hatcher Rinse cottoned on quick I went and done a guest show And then I got a phone call asking if we wanted to actually do a show on there. Not a grime show, but asking if I wanted to do a dubstep show on there. So I was like, yeah, by all means, let's do it. Now I think Code 9 joined the station. It was me and Code 9. Then Youngster joined the station. So then they had three DJs and then someone else joined and someone else joined. And the next thing you know, seven years later, it's a dubstep kind of station, really. Here's Mala. It is only fair to say that Rinse have, without a doubt, definitely been instrumental in supporting this sound. Scream! Well, it was the only place where you could get your tunes played, really, for a long time. Because nobody really wanted them in the clubs. They weren't the sort of more popular stuff other than Forward, but that still wasn't really rammed every week for a long time. So it was just sort of somewhere we could get get airplay easily. Easier than getting it on mainstream radio, I guess. National radio wasn't that far behind, though. Jada Flex was rapping on One Extra and one legendary Radio 1 DJ was playing dubstep records as part of his own eclectic mix. John Peel was actually the first person to play Digital Mystics on Radio 1. I remember getting a really, like, this email in 2004. It was just like, yeah, John Peel's been listening to some of your music, he really likes it, would you mind sending some stuff? And I checked out the playlist and that and he'd been playing some of my early records. So I remember sending him some music. See, someone like that, you know what I mean? The guy was, like, hardcore. He kind of told people what was going on rather than the other way around. This is Adult Sony by Digital Mystics, and hello to Mama out of uh, Digital Mystics. And Hamid says uh, good luck with uh, the job hunting. But the real queen of dubstep on Radio 1 was Mary Ann Hobbs. The scent of revolution is high in the air tonight. This is the Breeze Block Dubstep Wars special. Tonight you're going to feel the energy of the most exciting underground scene in the UK. Emerging out of South... Around about the end of 2005, you could just feel this kind of incredible momentum starting to build within the scene, this incredible energies in the clubs, in Ford, in DMZ. You could really feel the producers coming on in quantum leaps with every single new dub plate and... I just felt that there was a flashpoint about to happen and I really, really just wanted to try to capture some of this incredible, intense, raw energy of this emerging scene. They're getting the virus. They're being attached to something new. And in 06, it's just going to keep on going. Pinch. That was the starting point for so many people I've spoken to across the world. That one show made an enormous difference. It just opened ears and it was huge for the scene. It's also how much it touches me emotionally and how much it's like a ritual. When I'm on the decks and I'm playing this sand and the bass, I know it's for me. And that's for me. Plastician. They were big players in the scene at the time. So the scene was represented completely how it should have been um, by a massive mainstream radio station. The prime motivation. It was such an eclectic mix of sounds that people could connect with it on all manner of different levels. This is a bug, you're listening to Dubstep Wars on the Marianne Hobbs Breeze Block. 
to go to bed. I remember DJ Distance, who played last on the show that evening, putting up a little post on Dubstep Forum, which was a tiny fledgling website at that point with just like a couple of hundred members, um, just to say that the show was taking place. Within the space of five days, there were 20,000 hits on the thread. It was just phenomenal, the reaction to this programme. It was like the, the, the viral message travelling around the planet at a rate at which none of us had ever experienced in a lifetime. It's a hard job being a soldier, you know, breaking dubstep to the masses. Big up Marianne Hobbs. Still on the dubstep warpath, a year later, Marianne Hobbs took her soldiers to Spain for a showcase at the Sonar Festival in Barcelona. Got to the stage, it, just this gigantic space that holds eight and a half thousand people and Scream turned around and he said to me, oh my God, are you certain you know what you're doing? All we could see were these rivers of bodies flooding into the arena and it was just absolutely incredible. I remember Code 9 running up to me, just going like, oh my God, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. That night in Barcelona, we won the hearts of eight and a half thousand people and the message went right around the world, you know. Dubstep takes Sonar, it was on the front page of every European newspaper the next day and it, it was such a victory for all of us. You can feel this huge momentum building in the scene and a massive energy in the clubs. Ford was attracting a new crowd. At school, I remember my friends were always talking about a night called Forward. This is KTV. I just kind of was getting to the age of 18 and going raving as well. You step into that room in Plastic People and it is just all about the sound because you can't really see anyone, you can't really hear anything apart from the, the ginormous speakers that are like that are playing this sick music. So the atmosphere is really cool. When I went for my university interview, I was talking to the lecturers about it and they were like, I was like, yeah, there's this genre called dubstep. And they were like, yes, 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 we know all about dubstep. 2007, another milestone in dubstep production was about to drop. Benga. When I started to write that album, Diary of an Afro Warrior, and some of the tracks on that were really big songs. I, I had one called 26 Bass Lines, which was going off really like, big in the clubs, and I had Crunked Up, which was quite different, and then Night, which was like, the, the very, very big record with Koki. Night was like the biggest tune, like when we went Iron Napa, like for that whole crowd, like it crossed over into that whole funky thing, it crossed over to everything. A little bit like Midnight Request Line, it became a tune that really seemed to unify the whole of dance music's communities across the board. I remember someone coming back and telling me that EZ, he played it in Iron Napa. Back when we were young, EZ was one of our heroes. Me and Benga were actually touring at the time in America and every state knew about it, to South America, all the way up to Canada. Everyone was terrorising Benga. When is it coming? When is it coming? When can we buy it? So, yeah, that was the next step. and Koki smash night. At the time, Benga was touring North America and it wasn't just the USA that was feeding the scene. As we've said, dubstep was gaining a stronghold across the globe. Well, 2007 was kind of the starting point of it becoming a, a scene in the eyes of ordinary people, I guess. Pinch. You know, um, promoters wanting to book stuff. It started to be like, OK, you know, this, some of us make kind of making a living out of this and it's sort of that's cool <laughs> Shanghai in China was great I played in Beijing as well but specifically the Shanghai gig was just off the hook people banging on the walls you know it's this cool little club in an old uh, bomb shower it's called the shelter and you just go in and it's sort of like this tunnel but the vibe was just thick but there's always like one tune that switched people and like as soon as you drop it it's just like ah, that's a good feeling 
You know, I've taken someone who's gone on a little journey. They didn't understand what they were listening to at the start of it, but now at this point they've connected with it. Digital mystics. Almost every week we're in a completely different country. I mean, there's, there's scenes everywhere in the world now. We've just got back from New York. We've been to Tel Aviv, Moscow, Slovenia, Holland, Spain, Portugal. Malo went to Japan. I've been really lucky. I've actually been to like 22 countries this year. And some of them places I've been like the first person to maybe go and play. The sound to people. Oris J. It sounds I've been playing in odd places for 10 years, so that side of things didn't really change for me. Only thing what changed is people gave it a name. I would get booked to play like Garage or Two Step or Dark Garage, or they didn't really know what to, to call it. They would just normally just put like my name and the label that I'm on. But then all of a sudden, there was the emails were very specific. They were like, we want you to play dubstep. I played in Japan and you would you would have never guessed you was in Japan once you're in there because it's bass, people are dancing the same, moving the same, responding the same, they know the tunes the same as they would in England. I learned that once I'm abroad, I can actually play as, as deep and as dark as I would in the UK because they know the tunes or, or at least they know the vibe of the tunes or what to expect. And it's not just about British DJs playing out in other countries. There are scenes springing up in many far-flung corners of the world. Hi, this is Druva from Subsuara in Brooklyn, New York. Now, I mean, it's very, very vibrant in New York. There's, there's many dubstep parties. It's not just an underground thing, too. I think a lot of people are aware of it. I mean, the New York Times has covered dubstep, and that's how prevalent it's become. This is Dave from Subsuara. I just went to see the guys Hellfire and Machina here in Hellfire and Machina in New York just put on Caspa with U.S. support acts with Vibe Squad and the Anti Serum. And then in New York, you've got Trouble and Bass and Drop the Lime, who are who are still doing their events. So it's a it's certainly a combination of local talent, national talent, and international talent. San Francisco, I think, is almost the the center of it. There are so many nights and so many producers across the, the gamut of you know underground bass music, from house that's coming from UK funky at one thirty on up to the sort of more traditional trajectory of dubstep into. Folks who are like 23 and throwing huge raves with big, aggressive sounds. There's a scene in L.A., there's a scene in Chicago. Anywhere there's places with clubs, there's dubstep. We've played in some pretty out places here in the States. The Big Island of Hawaii was definitely the, the most out of the way that we played this summer. That was an arts festival, and it was definitely a sort of out scene in general. Yeah, and, you know, in some of these festivals that we played, they're in the smaller ones, you know, it's like, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people. And it's on a farm, you know, and we're playing bass music in a barn house. It's amazing. I mean, they bring in a banging sound system and the high production quality, but, you know, there's like haystacks on the side. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Dave played uh, an event in, in Mumbai, was it? I played, I played two, one in Delhi and then the week after that in Bombay. There's some good producers there doing stuff, too. Um, it's not just coming from externally, it's coming from within as well. And, yeah. you know, a good friend of ours, a lot of people in India know him as DJ Nasha. He was a DMC champion in India and a great friend of ours and a really great DJ and producer. Uh, once he got really into dubstep, he started uh, going by an alter ego called Breed. And he's been really kind of a, one of the trailblazers for dubstep and in India and kind of socializing it and exposing people to it and making it, doing events around it. So and there's def he's definitely kind of the ambassador over there. So it's nice to see things are really coming, you know, generating from there as well. Japan also has a scene. Here's one of the main movers and shakers, Goth Trad, who started a night called Back to Chill. I had a lot of good experience through dubstep and met a lot of people. When I started MySpace, I talked with some UK people and people in US, Asia... I uh, wrote some instrumental grime, and I sent some. I give some, gave some DJs in UK, and they said uh, it's dubstep. And I started party, and I started to play DJ. It's called uh, Back to Chill. So pretty much anywhere you go in the world, you will find a local underground dubstep scene. 
with the sound becoming more and more popular, it was only a matter of time before the major players started wanting in on the act. <laughs> Gia. 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 Like when they showed me the dubstep, I was like, wow, yeah, it's funny, it fits right in with yes. It's just the mean sinisterness, and I love it, and I love how they blended like a lot of like uh, the Caribbean vibe to it. That's why I can't wait. My name's Martin Clark. I produce uh, and blog as Blackdown, and I run Key Sound Recordings. People in clubs around the world were already discovering dubstep and knew it between 06 and 08, but it was the way that it started to infiltrate the US mainstream rap community, which was particularly insane. I think the tipping point for that was really Snoop Dogg using Chasing Status's anthem, and that was just kind of from something that started as about 50 of us in a small club in East London, it just seemed absolutely impossible to hear um, someone the size of Snoop Dogg uh, even knowing or even talking about dubstep was absolutely incredible. I'm still grinding the streets of jungle and I came out of line. Open fire killer, Long Beach side the rillers. Come inside the village, kitchen full of pots and skillets. Plastician mixed a uh, mixtape that folks featured that Snoop Dogg track and a bunch of other USMCs overbeat some people like Joker and himself, uh, Chase and States and so on. And um, I think that was really kind of a, a tipping point in terms of their awareness of dubstep and this being this niche London or UK bass sound that's, that might connect with US rap. Smog is a uh, LA-based dubstep night running for three years now. Plastician. They also run a record label called Smog. They're just a really cool bunch of people that like are all like driven by their love for dubstep and pushing it to the masses. So I went out there, played the two-year, met a guy called Coaster, said he was working for, I can't remember exactly which record label, it was a major record label, and he was saying like he wanted me to do some remixes for some rappers. He played some tracks to Snoop Dogg and was really trying to get him to like do a freestyle. And then Snoop picked up on the Chase and Status track, and it's like, right, well, now we've got Snoop on it, like, let's, let's see who else we can get on this. I was sending him over loads of instrumentals just to play to people who were passing through the office. So anyone who was passing through the office, he was just like, here's some tracks like see if you can do something we're doing this project and a lot of people um, were real positive about it and got back to us and we did some tracks and you saw people like Chase and Stay is working with Rihanna Bengo uh, and Scream working with Eve. These are really major A-list artists in terms of their global reach, so it's pretty crazy. You know, the first dubstep records sold struggled to sell 300 copies, and they're still some of the best dubstep records ever made, but now you're talking the scale of Rihanna and, and those guys, and that's a completely different ballgame. There was a mixed reaction to the UK producer and US rapper dubstep collaborations. I love Chase and Status. I think their tunes are sick. End time. But I'm not really feeling like the vocal which went on top of it. Snoop Dogg spitting on it. For me, it didn't sound right. A couple months pass. Things is looking better. I got a record deal. And a Hatcher. Yeah, it's interesting to know that, you know, Snoop Dogg's done a dub plate for Joker, Scream and Benga and he's been on this track and that track and Ludacris is interested and, you know, it's all good. It's all gravy, you know. Just it's, the word dubstep just grows and grows and grows, and that just means everyone gets to grow and grow and grow. And no one can do it better. Oris J. If Snoop Dogg asked me to make tunes for him, I would say leave the dubstep thing alone, and I'll make you some hip hop stuff because you don't suit dubstep, mate. Real spit. I became a Snoop Dogg millionaire, man. Give me the Oscar. Dubstep actually launched massively when, you know, the Screams, the Bengas, the Ruscos, the Caspers, when they start doing their commercial remixes and start getting airplay on national radio, that's when it started to actually just leapfrog into the next league, you know. Scream. The LaRue one, it was just a, it was kind of a fluke, really. I agreed to do it without listening to it and then just put the acapella over a track I'd already done. It sort of worked. I'm going in for Like the Claxons remix come up, I actually approached the label and um, 
said, can I do it? And they was like, all right. But never accepted it, but leaked it. So I just put it out online. Um, yeah, it was cool. I was, I'm really, I've always been into indie. I was asked to do Claxon's Roots, I asked to do Bat, bat for Lashes. Like, I don't mind asking. <laughs> <laughs> demand for dubstep remixes is also causing some division in the camps. Don't take remixes that I'm not interested in. You know, if someone sends me some indie track with a vocal, I'd be like a dubstep remix with a vocal on it. You're like, it's not going to work. I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't care about the money. I'm not going to do it. Pinch. You know, you can burn out your creative drive by trying to make other people's things sound cool. Why bother? I'm sure things can be done in certain situations which leave a kind of credible result but um, I haven't got the patience to find it Benga I think it's like with anything when you shoot a video or whatever it's like you need that raw vibe and with, without it you can just tell it straight away no matter who's produced the song you can tell how it, it's, there's no there's no realness to it I must you can't re just recreate it because you can tell it feels fake do you know what I mean there's so many tracks that you just can tell they've gone what they've tried to do and it's like, no, it didn't quite work, did it? Kind of like, all right, what crap's been popular in the past? Let's just put a dubstep beat on it and signature wobble. And here we go, anthem, great. LB. Any club scene, any club culture movement that becomes massive on the underground is going to be tapped into by the major record labels and exploited, if you were, put in a quid, earn free. But don't get it twisted. If you're selling units, then yeah, as soon as you're not selling units, there's not going to be nothing on the TV. There's not going to be, you'll be shelved, and there won't be no deals going on, and you'll be back to underground again. It's nothing new, it's nothing new. Just the major record labels buying into and exploiting a little bit of the underground, isn't it? And there's one side of the genre that's got a whole army of haters. You know what I'm talking about. In fact, people disliked it so much, they renamed it Broster. It's a genre that, that attracts the um, male audience. And at some point in the night, most of them will get their T-shirts off. I think it was invented as a joke, uh, a bit like the word bromance or something like that, and it just kind of stuck because it, because it worked. You know, it suited the kind of energetic, noisy, mid-range bass music that young men like to jump up and down to and, and hug each other. For me, for me, it describes the North American sound and the Canadian sound, which is, you know... As I understand it, people like Excision, Datsik, some of the English heads like Fun Case, Flux Pavilion, so on and so forth, Circus Records, I think is, you know, one of your main offenders, slash, uh, you know, labels, contributors is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just the sort of uh, the energetic sound of now. So hands up the main offenders, Jakes. You could say I, I uh, make something akin to Bro Step, but I eat them alive. And I still bring some swagger to it. There ain't no swagger in Bruce. And Rusko. Have you ever wondered why it is we love this music? Because it's what we do. Bro Step is sort of my fault, but now I'm starting to hate it in a way. It's like, I kind of took it there, and now everybody else has taken it too far. It's not heavy metal. I think, I've, again, I've been in America for touring for a long time, and even more so, they just want it as hard as you can. They're like, Rusko, I want you to melt my face off tonight. Like, play the hardest, hardest you've got. And I'm like, it's not about playing the hardest, hardest tracks for an hour and a half. It's like someone's screaming in your face for an hour. You don't want that. A lot of dubstep fans just come because they want to hear the most disgusting, hard, dirty, distorted music possible. And that's not what it's about. I don't know, tried to put a bit more energy into it. Trying to not that I didn't think it was there was anything wrong with it in the first place. I just tried to sort of see if it would go there and tried to take it there really. Yeah, I was just really surprised that people people were into it. People were really, really loving dubstep, but just wanted to just rock out, just really get down in the in, in the rave and it sort of turned it a little bit more into a sort of rave type of thing. Now it's gone too far, I think. It's got too noisy for noisy's sake. You know, it's lost a little bit of the feeling, so I'm trying to be a bit more melodic now, actually, and actually a little bit less crazy crazy. Let's have a listen to the track that split the dubstep scene like no other. It is, of course, Roscoe's Cockney Thug. But it's probably one of the, the quickest tracks. It was made the day of a show as an intro. That's why it has no intro. Ten seconds of talking and then bang, because I'd made it as an intro for my gig. 
And then again, it was it was two and a half minutes, you know, long enough to play and mix into the next track and we're off. And I played it and I was like, oh my God, what happened there? So then I played it again at the end of the set and um, yeah, just completely, it was never meant as anything more than an intro. When your spirit is floating down that tunnel toward the light, you know what's behind the light? It's not God, it's me. And I'm going to kick your poncy soul all the way back down the tunnel till you choke on your own ribs. Now, wake the f*** up. Roscoe's Cockney Thug, a notorious scene spitter. You're listening to the story of Dubstep on Radio 1 and 1 Extra. 2010 and back to those three blokes from Croydon tearing up festivals and arenas around the UK and beyond. Here's Magnetic Man on Nick Grimshaw's show. Nick Grimshaw. How are these days now when you're all together and you have to do that sort of relentless promo, like a proper long, proper band? <laughs> yeah? Yes. Yeah, long. It's all right. <laughs> what are you talking about? What's your most asked question? Um, how did you lot meet? Yeah. yeah. So how did you lot meet? <laughs> how did I know that was coming? Well, <laughs> tell them the true story. The yeah, true have, you, story. have you started tell, making them up yet? Yeah. Yeah, we have, but we're now, tell for you, we're going to tell you the truth. Okay, come on. Benga, hit him. <laughs> Why are you putting it on me? Tell him the truth. Okay, the truth is, we, um, me and Oliver, we used to do ballet dancing. It's, it's weird. I know it's weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Urban um, ballet dancing, actually. Um, oh, quite a street ballet. <laughs> yeah, in the Whitgift Centre in Croydon. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, we know that's not true. Listen online to last week's Radio 101 Extra Stories to find out how they really met. There might be some conflicts in the dubstep scene, the major labels versus the underground, tear-up tracks versus deeper sounds, but the heads can't knock Magnetic Man. Magnetic Man's not a thing that just was created for a laugh two weeks ago. This is something that's been building for 10 years, probably longer than that. So you got to think of it's well-deserved and they've earned it because they've grafted every day to get to it. And if he was here now, I'd give them all a hug and that and give them some sweets and that or whatever because they deserve it. If you don't work in the bedroom building music for 10 years to stay at that same point in your life, you, the idea is to keep progressing, to gain something. And they've just gained everything that they've wanted to gain. Being such a big sound now, it's, it is down to these boys. It's create a wonderful gateway for a whole raft of new fans to step through and to find this incredible world, if they want to, behind the pop music of awesome, really highly experimental underground beats. So Benga, Scream and Artwork have found the new way of bringing dubstep to a wider audience with Magnetic Man. But meanwhile, back in Bristol, producers on the underground scene are developing new sounds. The way that I've seen Bristol develop in recent years has just been absolutely inspirational. I, mean, I think if you look now at the whole kind of multiverse label group, which includes things as diverse as obviously DJ Pinch's Tectonic Empire, Joker's label Capsize, and then, you know, you have really, really wonderful labels like Apple Pits, which are doing something completely, utterly different, you know, much more influenced by minimal techno. Then you have the Hench Crew run by Jakes, and you have tons and tons of tiny little empires I suppose in Bristol at the moment I don't even know how many record labels there are that are based in Bristol it's like a dozen 20 or something I don't know I've kind of lost track I'm always a huge fan of what Peverus is doing he's a friend of mine anyway so I might be a little bit biased but he's just got a, a real sensibility about creating something which is which has got his own space in it I mean, Jake's got some wicked tunes. He's one of the few that can do insane tear-out and also do hard-hitting deep stuff. 
I can't get enough of Addison Groove at the moment. Pony's really just killing it at the moment. I mean, Foot Crab was a surprise anthem. No one was really expecting it. Very keen on what Guido and Jamie are up to. Guido dropped a wicked album earlier this year on Punch Drunk. Jamie is working on some bits and pieces from, from my knowledge. He's looking to put an album together soon. I mean, I had a nice little moment at the last DMZ fifth birthday where the two standout tunes that were getting dropped by everyone all night, London, anyone, you know, wherever they were from, and getting wheeled up was Foot Crab by Addison Groove and Tron by Joker. Everyone knows about Joker, his sound and his profile's just blown up massively the last couple of years. Jemmy and Joker were the first two purveyors, I guess, of the purple sound, which is very, very synth-heavy. I remember Code 9 famously describing it as um, a little bit like uh, Wiley trapped in a lift with the 80s group Cameo. <laughs> really and truthfully, there's only been three people drawn into it. Joker, who's kind of pioneered it, I guess, and Jemmy and Guido on the periphery. Um, Guido not quite so keen on it. I think all three of those guys have been tagged with the, the, the sort of you know the purple name. Probably hate it. I think it's something that was that not taken out of context necessarily, but focused upon so much that it's become some kind of bizarre entity in itself, which doesn't actually exist. The whole name spawned out of a kind of off-the-cuff remark that Joker made. I can't remember if he was in Copenhagen or I don't know somewhere being interviewed and in typical mad joker style he just kind of barked out some nonsense and people took it seriously so i think it's brilliant you know as i said to him you know see how, see how things have changed now you can just go and spat in your nonsense and people start taking it serious now so you've made it son let's have a listen to joker purple city cut from joker i'm mr jam and you've been listening to the story of dubstep on radio one and one extra we're out of time but the story doesn't end here how is the scene evolving it's like some kind of trans- transitional period at the moment it's all eyes on deck at the moment do you know what i mean lb because of all the djs i'm djing alongside now Ben UFO, Ramadan Man, Lofa, blah, blah, blah. All these guys are like, even Ben Gurren and Scream and all that. They ser- they seem to be searching for a, a fresher, newer, more constructive, rich sound in their DJ sets. Sometimes scenes move in very linear ways and sometimes they fragment and break into different pieces. Black down. At the moment we, have, we see things fragmenting around people who are or were involved with dubstep and that fragmentation is a very exciting time and one to be treasured. When things become all the same thing, it becomes, very, it becomes really boring uh, very quickly and people move on. So that's what we're seeing right now is it influenced by UK Funky or the LA sound or all different types of other stuff, people influenced by grime, all being blended together and when you don't know what that is, that's usually a good point. There's a limit to your care. Who are the hottest artists and producers to keep your eye on? Producer James Blake. So carelessly there. I think he does an incredible sound. I don't even know what it is yet. That's a really good thing. Is it truth or care? Jam City is probably most indicative of the best producers, I think, from the Bot Box Night Slugs camp. Dark Star on Hyperdub. Very excited about the Roscoe album from the UK funky scene. Where will the sound go next? It's exploded in so many different ways. DJ thinking. It's difficult to keep a handle on it. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a buyer at a dubstep shop, so I see every dubstep record that gets made and I get to listen to it, and even I can't keep track of it. There's a big jungle movement at the moment, you know, I know Scream helped to bring that about. I think that the whole crossover between techno and dubstep is, is massively blurred now. There's this sort of huge grey cloud between between the UK and Berlin and places like that. There's sort of this weird miasma of, of is it techno, is it dubstep, does anyone care kind of scene. 
I think the good thing that everyone always really appreciate about dubstep, I mean, we've said it from the very beginning, is that sort of anything goes. Peverlist. And like it used to be sort of like a tempo, like 140, but even now, people are making things all over the tempo range. So they've got scuba, you've got distance, people making like 170 kind of drum and bass stuff that D-Bridge is playing. You've got people making 130 kind of funky influence house stuff and you've got stuff in between as well. So I think it's like people are just inspired by all the different sounds that are coming from England and elsewhere and, and throwing it all into the mix. This is the good thing about dubstep because you can have a lineup of dubstep DJs and producers and that they can all be playing their own interpretation of the sound. Hatcher. You've got the more like dubbier sound of dubstep, the half step, hard stuff, then you've got the techno y side of it. It's mad because the amount of people that are involved in dubstep, there's so many different varieties of the sound. Oris J. There'll be sounds in a track that I've never heard before and I've no idea how to make or no idea how they created that sound. That, to me, is inspiring. Will it even be called dubstep? To me, it is still all dubstep, but you can go to different people in a different town, let alone a different country, and you can say the word dubstep and they think of different things. Do they think of Rusco? Do they think of Flux Pavilion? Or do they think of Loafer? Or do they think of Youngster? You know, those are all... Very, very different people that make very different kinds of music. Most people are really into the scenes and the way and, the, and spotting where they change and, and being surprised and going to clubs and having that jaw dropping. Oh my God, what is that moment? Lots of us always are always looking for that moment, the, the life changing, most intense dance floor experience, where you are just totally blown away by what the DJ is playing. Surprise, sucker punched by it. If you're looking for that then it's the spirit of what dubstep was rather than the, what the name dubstep is now. And it's the spirit of what dubstep was combined with a bunch of other things, and uh, so I'd go chasing that at all costs. Eyes to the future. Actually, I, I genuinely am feeling like next year is going to be something interesting. I think there's a few things bubbling away in the background and I just get a feeling that the expectation for something with an element of surprise has come back and, you know, I'm looking forward to being surprised next year. It moves forward every day in a thousand million tiny steps in all kinds of different directions and that's what keeps it really thrilling that ultimately you never really know what's around the next corner. I don't know what's going to happen next week, let alone in six months or in 2012. And I don't want to know because that's what keeps it so fresh and keeps it so exciting. The fact that technology is so easily accessible to so many people and you've got obviously all the global platforming now. So that's what keeps the whole thing moving so quickly now and mutating all the time. And that's a wonderful thing for me to see. And I don't want to be able to predict the future. I don't, I don't need a crystal ball. I, I want to be surprised and delighted by what's around the next corner that I can't yet see.